Daenerys Targaryen was born to burn the others with dragon fire. Let it be known. By the end of the very first book, we can see that it was, at the very least, her destiny to wake dragons from stone. And what are dragons good for? Burning the others, I say. Let's not overthink this. Using dragons to conquer other men is essentially the temptation that Danny must avoid, in my opinion. I mean, it's one thing to use the dragons to burn slave masters and free slaves, which I fully endorse. But it seems clear to me that using the dragons to reconquer the land of her ancestors by force is a trap. It's a trap! And a path to destruction. But here's the thing, Danny's admirable habit of using her dragons to free slaves and protect the weak is not only one of her best qualities, and a great reason why she could never become a butcher of innocent civilians. Cough, cough. It's also one of the key foreshadowings of her ultimate destiny, which is using her dragon power to help defeat the others. The others, as you may have noticed, hold the dead in eternal bondage, which you could certainly consider magical slavery. Indeed, the Whites are called the Thralls of the Others, with the implication being that some part of the dead person's soul is trapped inside their enchanted corpse, unable to find eternal peace, and perhaps even condemned to watch the horror being wrought with their own dead hands. It's quite the abomination, a problem in search of a solution. And then along comes Queen Daenerys Targaryen, with her dragons and her penchant for burning slave masters with dragonfire. It seems like a pretty good match. An abolitionist dragon lord and ice demons who make the dead their slaves. And yea, I say unto thee, burning the others and freeing the whites from icy servitude would make a most fitting climax to the strong abolitionist arc of Danny's story. And when I took a look, I found that it's in Danny's most important scenes of freeing slaves and protecting the weak that we find the foreshadowing of Danny using the dragons to burn, or more likely melt, the others. We'll take a look at those scenes today, and you'll see how nicely these two ideas have been woven together to foreshadow the true destiny of Daenerys Targaryen. Hey friends, it's LML saying hi from Birdland, and just reminding you to click like, click subscribe, do all the YouTube stuff, leave a comment, because I gotta buy this bird seed, man. Let's start with the basics. Does dragon fire melt the others? HBO says no. But that doesn't make any sense, frankly. Their Night King was impervious to Drogon's full furnace blast, but then popped like a porcelain statue dropped from a third-story balcony the moment a small dragonglass dagger touched his icy skin. Even though he already had an identical dragonglass knife lodged in his chest for the last several eons. So yeah, like I said, none of this shit really made sense, and without beating a dead horse any further, where did that horse come from? I'll just say that we can't let the things that happened on the show overly influence what we think about the books, especially where it concerns magical elements like the White Walkers and the dragons. The showrunners, quite frankly, didn't have any appreciation or understanding of those things by their own admission. Returning to the question of whether Dragonfire might be a potent weapon against the others, it's hard to draw any other conclusion from Danny's dream in A Storm of Swords, which which she has aboard the ship named after Beleriand the Black Dread, the dragon of Aegon the Conqueror. That night she dreamt that she was Rhaegar, riding to the Trident, but she was mounted on a dragon, not a horse. When she saw the usurper's rebel host across the river, they were armored all in ice, but she bathed them in dragon fire, and they melted away like dew and turned the Trident into a torrent. Some small part of her knew that she was dreaming, but another part exulted. This is how it was meant to be. The other was a nightmare, and I have only now awakened. Enemies armored in ice are obviously meant to represent the others, and melting them with dragon fire is how it was meant to be. It's likely that this dream was partially or fully implanted by Quaithe, who appears in the cabin of Beleriand via glass candle astral projection the moment that Danny wakes from the dream. Quaithe is consistently encouraging Danny to embrace her dragon nature, so it kind of makes sense that Quaithe is trying to plant in Danny's mind the notion of using her dragons to melt enemies armored in ice, that she's trying to warm her up to the idea, if you will. Quaithe is also constantly telling Danny to go north, you must go south. And why would Danny need to go north? To melt others with her dragons, presumably. It seems pretty unlikely that Quaithe would just be wrong about dragon fire being effective against the White Walkers. I mean, that would just be kind of stupid, right? What would even be the point of the dragons in that case? No, I think what's more likely to be true is that if Dragonglass slays White Walkers, as we've seen it do in the hands of Sam Tarly, Sam the Slayer, and if the last hero's Dragon Steel sword slew the others, as legends say it did, then the unbelievably hot fire of a full-grown dragon should definitely do the trick. 
I do think the others will have weapons to hurt the dragons, whether that be weapons made of magical ice or those nasty cold winds, so I'm expecting a good fight. But if the dragons can't melt the others with their dragon fire, then there really wouldn't be a fight at all, and Danny might as well save herself a lot of trouble and just fly her dragons to the Summer Isles and retire. Anyway, returning to Danny's dream of fighting the Battle of the Trident on Dragonback, it's easy to see how the archetypal struggle against the others would be grafted onto Rhaegar's fateful battle with the dreaded Usurper at the Trident in Danny's mind. Danny Danny is often compared to Rhaegar, either by herself or by the narrative, especially in key moments such as her climactic Wake the Dragon dream in A Game of Thrones. And saw her brother Rhaegar mounted on a stallion as black as his armor. Fire glimmered red through the narrow eye slit of his helm. The last dragon, Sir Jorah's voice whispered faintly. The last, the last. Danny lifted his polished black visor. The face within was her own. After that, for a long time, there was only the pain, the fire within her, and the whisperings of stars. The whisperings of stars, eh? Hi, Quave! In any case, we can see that Danny's transformation into the last dragon is conceptualized as her becoming Rhaegar, as stepping into his fiery shoes and armor, so to speak. In another vision from this Wake the Dragon dream, Danny even sprouts dragon wings and flies herself. So she's becoming the dragon in every sense here. Then two books later, after having hatched the dragons, she's dreaming of fighting Rhaegar's famous battle, but as a dragon lord confronting enemies armored in ice. The message being sent is clear. Danny was born to wake dragons and to become the dragon, specifically so she can do battle with the others. That will be Danny's Battle of the Trident, her defining and penultimate battle. Danny dreaming of bathing the others in dragon fire is certainly sweet, but what's really insightful is that she has this Rhaegar Trident dragon dream the night before she frees the Unsullied and burns the so-called wise masters of Astapor. Here are the lines leading up to the Rhaegar dream. I was alone for a long time, Jorah, all alone but for my brother. I was such a small, scared thing. Viserys should have protected me, but instead he hurt me and scared me worse. He shouldn't have done that. He wasn't just my brother, he was my king. Why do the gods make kings and queens if not to protect the ones who can't protect themselves? Some kings make themselves. Robert did. He was no true king, Danny said scornfully. He did no justice. Justice, that's what kings are for. Sir Jorah had no answer. He only smiled and touched her hair so lightly it was enough. Danny is reflecting here upon one of the central questions of A Song of Ice and Fire, which is how to do justice as a leader, and she arrives at the answer that she must protect the weak. This is the thinking which underlies her decision to turn the Unsullied against the Slave Masters. It's not enough for her to buy the Unsullied and treat them better or even set them free. She decides she must end the practice entirely and deliver a death sentence to the Masters, so that no young boys are ever again made to strangle puppies or kill infants in front of their mothers. I think it will be just the same when Daenerys faces the others. Danny will be going for the jugular and trying to make sure that no one is ever again turned into a white. That no women like Gilly ever again have their sons taken from them by men like Craster and given to the others. So after talking of justice and defending the weak, Queen Daenerys dreams of fighting the others on Dragonback as Rhaegar. And the next day, when she burns the slave masters, she once again sees herself as Rhaegar. Danny mounted her silver. She could feel her heart thumping in her chest. She felt desperately afraid. Was this what my brother would have done? She wondered if Prince Rhaegar had been this anxious when he saw the usurper's host formed up across the trident with all their banners floating on the wind. On the way to meet the masters, Danny also thinks about having a Targaryen banner sewn, a banner such as Rhaegar might have borne. Then after taking command of the Unsullied and turning to face the slave masters, she thinks, it is time to cross the trident. All of these quotes invite the reader to draw a comparison between Danny's burning of the slave masters and Rhaegar's battle of the trident, just as Danny herself is doing. And by association, we're being encouraged to think about Danny burning the ice armored foes in her trident dream the night before, when she burns the masters and frees the unsullied the next day. Now, it's certainly easy to see the Unsullied as symbolic stand ins for the Whites. Danny flat out thinks of them as 8,000 brick eunuchs with dead eyes that never move, which makes the Unsullied sound like an army of the Walking Dead. Going further, we can observe that they've had their names taken from them and their personality suppressed to the point of being almost erased, very like a person's soul being trapped inside their own corpse as they are forced to join the army of the Living Dead against their will. 
The Unsullied are presented as robotically obedient with Slave Master Krasnismo Naklaus <laughs> saying, Tell her that these have been standing here for a day and a night, with no food nor water. Tell her that they will stand until they drop if I should command it. Which is exactly how the Whites behave. They remain completely motionless until their master's command, pretty much like robots. Krasniz <laughs> goes on to call them absolutely obedient, absolutely loyal, and utterly without fear, and says that death means nothing to them, and maiming less than nothing. That's my best smarmy, pretentious, nauseating slave master voice. Hope you guys like it. Anyway, it's pretty easy to see that these descriptions, once again, could apply equally well to the Ice Whites or the Unsullied. Finally, we can never forget that the Unsullied are, of course, victims of unbelievable atrocity. And the same is true of the dead people turned into Whites. I think it's important to point out that Danny actually frees the Unsullied and gives them a choice to go their own way or do whatever they want. The Unsullied also reclaim names and self-identity, which are important potential thematic parallels to the idea of freeing whites from bondage so that their souls can find peace. As for those wise masters of Astapor, well, they aren't armored in ice, clearly, but they do sweat profusely all through the scenes that they're in. So I suppose we should think about melting white walkers. They're also encrusted in jewelry, so we can say that they came through drift, drift, drift. Drift. On my wrist, they drift. But that's neither here nor there. More importantly, we have the chilling fact that the slave masters steal children to make into soldiers, which is exactly what the others do. And finally, there's the matter of what the slave masters were trying to get from Danny, her dragon. And to get her dragon, they did. The black dragon spread his wings and roared. A lance of swirling dark flame took Krasnus full in the face. His eyes melted and ran down his cheeks, and the oil in his hair and beard burst so fiercely into fire that for an instant the slaver wore a burning crown twice as tall as his head. The sudden stench of charred meat overwhelmed even his perfume, and his wail seemed to drown out all other sound. You'll note that the slaver's eyes melt here, just as Danny melted her icy foes in her dream the night before. As for that tall, fiery crown, well, that's a clear symbol of Azor High, which might seem weird to see on top of someone who represents another. That is, unless you've seen my videos about how I think Azor High became the first Knight's King and created the others with Knight's Queen. Seeing a fiery crown appear atop someone who is supposed to be another right as they're being destroyed is kind of like giving us a glimpse into their true nature, if my theory is correct. This is similar to the way that the eyes like cold blue stars and burning ice language used to describe the others potentially gives us a clue about their having been created from the seed of a fiery dragon lord. But let's stay on topic and move on to our next group of symbolic others trying to harass Danny and steal her fire. Our next scene of incendiary foreshadowing brings us to the Undying Ones of Karth, and they're pretty easy to identify as symbolic others. When Danny enters their inner sanctum, she addresses them as those who have conquered death, as their undying moniker implies, and certainly the same is true of the others. The Undying are even presented as living shadows, like the others. A long stone table filled this room. Above it floated a human heart, swollen and blue with corruption, yet still alive. It beat, a deep, ponderous throb of sound, and each pulse sent out a wash of indigo light. The figures around the table were no more than blue shadows. The others are white shadows, or pale shadows, with blue eyes and blue swords, while the undying are blue shadows with, well, blue everything, including their eyes. These blue-eyed shadows are gathered around a corrupt blue heart, which I think makes for a terrific symbol of the Heart of Winter. If you think back to Bran's coma dream vision from A Game of Thrones, the Heart of Winter seemed to serve as a focal point for the threat of the others. So it makes sense to see these other-like blue shadow undying sort of gathered around a blue heart. Most tellingly, these blue shadows are in fact cold blue shadows, and this line comes as Danny's Shade of the Evening Visions dissolve into a disgusting physical attack by the Undying. But then black wings buffeted her round the head, and a scream of fury cut the indigo air, and suddenly the visions were gone, ripped away, and Danny's gasp turned to horror. The Undying were all around her, blue and cold, whispering as they reached for her, pulling, stroking, tugging at her clothes, touching her with their dry, cold hands, twining their fingers through her hair. 
This all seems like pretty clear symbolism. These blue and cold shadows are attacking Danny and trying to steal her fire, her life, as it says in another line. Fortunately, Drogon is nearby once again, and he knows just what to do with cold blue shadows. Then Indigo turned to orange and Whispers turned to screams. Her heart was pounding, racing. The hands and mouths were gone, heat washed over her skin, and Danny blinked at a sudden glare. Perched above her, the dragon spread his wings and tore at the terrible dark heart, ripping the rotten flesh to ribbons, and when his head snapped forward, fire flew from his open jaws, bright and hot. She could hear the shrieks of the undying as they burned, their high, thin, papery voices crying out in tongues long dead. Their flesh was crumbling parchment, their bones dry wood soaked in tallow. They danced as the flames consumed them. They staggered and writhed and spun and raised their blazing hands on high, their fingers bright as torches. You'll notice that the Undying speak in tongues long dead, and of course the others speak in scroth, or whatever you call the like ice cracking on a winter lake language they use in the prologue of A Game of Thrones. Now the Undying Ones don't melt here like Krasn is the slaver, but the description of them burning like crumbled parchment, dry wood, or candle wax or tallow, as well as staggering and dancing around while on fire, actually matches the description of whites catching on fire. Consider John's memory of the white that he and Ghost fought in Lord Commander Mormon's chamber in A Game of Thrones. Truly, the gods had heard John's prayer that night. The fire had caught in the dead man's clothing and consumed him as if his flesh were candle wax and his bones old dry wood. John had only to close his eyes to see the thing staggering across the solar, crashing against the furniture and flailing at the flames. It was the face that haunted him most, surrounded by a nimbus of fire, hair blazing like straw, the dead flesh melting away and sloughing off its skull to reveal the gleam of bone beneath. Bones like old dry wood, candle wax or tallow, straw this time instead of parchment, staggering and flailing and writhing, hair blazing and hands raised. It's pretty much the same description, whether we're talking about the burning whites or the burning undying. And even the slave masters are doing something similar. The point for now is that the burning of the undying is meant to evoke both the idea of melting the others and freeing the whites from bondage, because burning the others will have the effect of freeing the whites. Additionally, it seems like burning the whites themselves is also a way of freeing them from bondage. That's why they're dancing about and raising their hands. Seriously though, have a look at this scene from A Storm of Swords featuring Samwell Tarly, Sam the Slayer, setting fire to a whited small Paul, his former brother of the Night's Watch. Sam sucked in air and rolled feebly away. The white was burning, hoarfrost dripping from its beard as the flesh beneath blackened. Sam heard the raven shriek, but Paul himself made no sound. When his mouth opened, only flames came out, and his eyes. It's gone. The blue glow is gone. Sam being able to set Small Paul free of enchantment here is especially meaningful, because it was Small Paul who was the only one who helped Sam when he was ready to give in to death by frostbite after the Fist of the First Men. It's absolutely heartbreaking for Sam to see him whited. He attempts to plead with the whited Paul for mercy when he first appears, saying, Small Paul, do you remember me? I'm Sam. Fat Sam. Sam the Scared. You saved me in the woods. You carried me when I couldn't walk another step. No one else could have done that, but you did. Even though we're mostly talking about symbolism, the emotional beat is important here, because it's showing us the human tragedy of the cold whiting phenomena, thus emphasizing the need for a fiery abolitionist like Daenerys Targaryen, and maybe Jon too, of course. As for the idea of burning the whites to save their souls, this is also suggested by the religious beliefs of the Rolorists, twisted as they are. Relor, Sir Godfrey sang, we give you now four evil men, with glad hearts and true, we give them to your cleansing fires, that the darkness in their souls might be burned away. Let their vile flesh be seared and blackened, that their spirits might rise free and pure to ascend into the light. Accept their blood, O Lord, and melt the icy chains that bind your servants. Really interesting wording here. Fire is offered as a cleansing agent, purifying the flesh and releasing the soul. And this also involves melting icy chains that bind servants. Now when Sir Godfrey talks about icy chains, he's referring to the winter snows that are bogging down Stannis' army. But the potential double meaning here makes a lot of sense. We can think about the whites as the ones who need purification by fire, because they are enslaved by icy chains, so to speak. 
One also thinks back to Danny's Trident Dream, where she's bathing her foes armored in ice. Again, there's an implication in purifying or cleaning. Daenerys herself already understands that magical fire has the power to purify, because she's undergone just such a process. This is her second dragon dream from A Game of Thrones. There was only her and the dragon. Its scales were black as night, wet and slick with blood. Her blood, Danny sensed. Its eyes were pools of molten magma, and when it opened its mouth, the flame came roaring out in a hot jet. She could hear it singing to her. She opened her arms to the fire, embraced it, let it swallow her whole, let it cleanse her and temper her and scour her clean. She could feel her flesh sear and blacken and slough away, could feel her blood boil and turn to steam, and yet there was no pain. She felt strong and new and fierce. Well, this really does sound a lot like the descriptions of the whites burning, with the flesh boiling and blackening and burning away. And not only does the dragon fire seem to cleanse and renew Daenerys in this dream, she actually does wake the next morning with renewed strength and spirit. This same fiery transformation language is also echoed when Daenerys walks into Khal Drogo's funeral pyre to fulfill the prophecy of Azor High's rebirth and wake the dragons from their stone eggs. I can't help but wonder if these experiences with cleansing Dragonfire might clue Danny into the idea of using fire to free the Whites from magical bondage. At the very least, the reader is being presented early on with the general idea that Dragonfire can purify. And even if Danny's Dragon Dream is primarily poetic language, it's only a book and a half later that we see Sam actually drive the blue glow from a White's eyes with fire. Returning to that shady house of wine-drinking warlocks, there's one other important way that Danny burning the Undying foreshadows her freeing the Whites. Check out Danny's very last Shade of the Evening vision before waking to the Undying's attack. Ten thousand slaves lifted blood-stained hands as she raced by on her silver, riding like the wind. Mother, they cried. Mother, mother. They were reaching for her, touching her, tugging at her cloak, the hem of her skirt, her foot, her leg, her breast. They wanted her, needed her, the fire, the life. And Danny gasped and opened her arms to give herself to them. This is, of course, a prophetic glimpse of Danny freeing the slaves in Slaver's Bay and being recognized as Mysa, the mother. But notice the specific language about the 10,000 blood-stained hands of the slaves. The Ice Whites, famously, have hands which turn black with congealed blood, which runs into the extremities upon death, thus saith the living white known as Cold Hands. Ergo, the slaves with bloody hands sound a lot like the Whites, calling out to Danny for freedom. They need her fire to be free, and perhaps Danny's life. And I fully expect Danny's story to end with heroic self-sacrifice, by the way. And as you can see, Danny is fully prepared to give herself up to save those who cry out to her. That's true in this scene, and also in countless other scenes, which I outlined in my True Character of Daenerys Targaryen series. Setting aside her death foreshadowing for now, Danny's fire will indeed set the Whites free, and immediately upon being woken from the vision by Drogon, Drogon proceeds to burn the Undying and their rotten blue heart to ashes. That's very like the sequence of events in Astapor. Once again, we have the idea of melting the others with dragon fire, combined with the idea of freeing slaves who are described like Whites. That's what I call grade A foreshadowing, and it all points to the very sensible idea that Daenerys was given three dragons so that she can fight the others. One bonus round, b -b bonus round clue about the Undying as symbolic stand-ins for the others. When Pyat Pri first greets Danny, he promises to petition the Undying Ones for an audience, which he refers to as an honor rare as summer snows. Meeting the Undying is like getting snow in the summer. This really makes Danny's confrontation with the Undying seem even more like her giving battle to the others during the long night. It also reminds me of this famous exchange between Ned and Robert where the others are invoked. Late summer snows are common enough, Ned said. I hope they did not trouble you. They are usually mild. The others take your mild snows, Robert swore. What will this place be like in winter? I shudder to think. The others don't take summer snows, they give them. Hopefully we'll have some dragon lords around by that time. I think the chances are pretty good. All right, the final thing that I want to show you is the where of Danny's impending confrontation with the others. Her trident, Rhaegar dream, has her fighting the others at the trident, but I suspect that's simply because Rhaegar fought at the trident, and if Danny's dream hadn't taken place at the trident, then it wouldn't have been recognizable as the Battle of the Trident. 
Now, if the blue heart in the House of the Undying Ones is meant to represent the heart of winter, well, that could indicate Danny journeying north, very far north. Of course, that beating blue heart could be representing the heart of winter in a more general sense. Maybe it's referring to the power of the others, as opposed to suggesting that Danny has to go to the North Pole. So it's still not clear. But then we have this scene from A Dance with Dragons, and this is from Danny's final chapter of that book, where she's wandering around the Dothraki Sea after riding Drogon out of Daznak's pit in Marine. Danny lies down to sleep by a low stone wall and has a quaith dream. She finds herself flying amongst the stars with all her cares and burdens falling away. And through a mask made of starlight, Quaid is once more telling her that to go north, you must journey south. And also, remember who you are, Daenerys. The dragons know, do you? It seems that once again, Quaid is trying to link the idea of going north to embracing the power of her dragons. And when Danny wakes up, we see that very idea acted out in miniature. The next morning, she woke stiff and sore and aching, with ants crawling on her arms and legs and face. When she realized what they were, she kicked aside the stalks of dry brown grass that had served as her bed and blanket. She had bites all over her, little red bumps, itchy and inflamed. Where did all the ants come from? Danny brushed them from her arms and legs and belly. She ran a hand across her stubbly scalp where her hair had burned away and felt more ants on her head, and one crawling down the back of her neck. She knocked them off and crushed them under her bare feet. There were so many. It turned out that their anthill was on the other side of her wall. She wondered how the ants had managed to climb over it and find her. To them, these tumble-down stones must loom as huge as the wall of Westeros. All right, the symbolism pretty much leaps off the page here. We've got an army of hive-minded soldiers coming over a wall that is like the wall of Westeros and attacking Danny, which prompts her to cross over the wall to their side to find their source, their home. I think this is more or less exactly what will happen in Westeros proper. The others will invade Westeros and strike many blows, but Danny and probably Jon will have to journey north, perhaps to the heart of winter itself, to do something of critical importance to defeating or neutralizing the others. It's definitely promising how Danny has no problem brushing off the ants and crushing them underfoot, just as she has no problem roasting the undying ones once they present a danger to her. Well, I mean, Drogon roasts them, but the premise is that Danny's going to use the dragons to roast the others, so there you go. Now, if the ants are the others, then Danny is like some sort of giant mech warrior here, which is cool, but of course a little silly. I mean, it would be fun to see her go supersized like Dr. Manhattan, but that's probably not going to happen. I'm pretty sure that we're supposed to see Danny crushing the ants as Danny fighting the others from Dragonback, because earlier in the chapter, Danny remembers flying on Drogon's back and seeing horses far below, but they looked like ants to her. Ergo, when Danny is looking down at these ant enemies pouring over the wall, quote unquote, we should no doubt imagine Danny on Dragonback looking down at others and whites somewhere near the wall, or perhaps beyond it. There's actually another interesting line from this chapter that points the same direction, north. North they flew, beyond the river, Drogon gliding on torn and tattered wings through clouds that whipped by like the banners of some ghostly army. All right, so Danny is on Drogon and going north, and look, it's the banners of some ghost army. I wonder who that could be. Taken together with the scene with the miniature wall and the ants, it seems that this Danny chapter is showing us quite a bit of what the to go north part of Quaithe's mysterious instructions is all about, bringing fire and blood to the others. So there you have it, my friends. Danny's journey to the heart of winter to deal with the threat of the others for once and all will be the ultimate realization of her burn the masters and free the slaves ethos. It's likely that this monumental task will require her dragons, her fire, and her very life. But she'll be both saving the world and freeing tens of thousands of souls from magical bondage. We've seen that Danny is always willing to commit everything she has to protecting and saving her people. That she's always ready to lay her own life on the line for what she believes in. So I can really think of no more heroic and honorable conclusion to her story than this. Even though I know some of you want to see her sit on the Iron Throne. Think about it though, by using the dragons that she was given to melt the others, she'll be protecting every living and dead soul in Westeros. It's the perfect harmonization of her Mysa and dragon identities. And quite frankly, melting the ice demons really is the only thing to do with huge fire-breathing dragons. Hey everyone, Cleo and I say thanks for watching, thanks for finding the bird seed, and I'll just quickly remind you that I tend to do live streams every week a few days after I do one of these produced videos and I include any sort of extra material that I may have not had time for and I got some good stuff coming 
So make sure you check out the Danny live stream that'll follow up on this one. I'll see you next time. Now it's time to thank some Patreon sponsors. Thank you.